Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Simon Sokwabe, an executive from the Civil Aviation Authority. I am your servant. I am here to serve you. My presentation is basically looking since part one one was implemented and effected and promulgated, gazetted, what has happened. That would be my flight plan. The purpose of this presentation, really, I'm not here to defend CAA. If they need a defense, they'll have sent their attorneys. But the intent is to say, the ARPES is not a matter of the ARPES are coming. They are here. We said this six years ago, and we cannot be saying the same statement again. And this growing, a rapid growing sector has brought its own challenge. A lot of entities, a lot of individuals are affected. We fold our hands and say it will solve itself. Maybe let's go a little bit back. Who brought it? The human beings. Can CAA do this by themselves? Remember, they're not an operator. They're not an ATO. They don't design. They don't even make them. They regulate what you bring. It's basically what you bring that determines what regulation comes up. If we take them away, we don't need to go on one. But like I said, this is the sector that is growing at a pace that it's not CAA or South Africa that's not coping. The rest of the world is not coping. We are not condoning, not coping. But how best we iron out to enable this growth? I'm glad Filippo came before me. This structure is almost applicable to every state. We've got an act that governs all of the civil aviation activities in the country. In our act, you find the GEO Convention. There's three articles I will refer to that affect the part of this discussion today. Then we write our regulation. That's where you find the part 101. He spoke earlier on about Annex 1 amendment, which will be what Akaya will have issued as a standard and recommended practices. With that, he mentioned Akaya documentation. That was a talk, 19, uh, 9. Then we also write what you call the technical standard, which basically is a simpler version of the law, how you implement what is called for by the regulation. This is what forms our legislative structure. Now let's go to the act. There's three bullets really I'm interested in for your discussion. We said we'll establish CAA to provide and regulate civil aviation within the republic. Let's go to the last bullet, to provide for additional measures directed at more effective control of the safety and security of aircraft, airports, and the like. What does this mean? In the absence of the act, is it free for all? As we like it, let's do it. We became the member of the signatory to your convention because the intent of the convention really was to standardize the application of the civil aviation. The three conventions I'm referring to, the, the, the articles of the convention, let's go to Article 4. Can the civil aviation be misused? Let's go to what Filippo spoke earlier on. This is beyond safety and security. Let's go to privacy. Are all the drones flying out there, flying out for the intended purpose for what the civil aviation was, or for other purposes that other interest groups have their those purposes? You stay around here. You've read the local newspapers. There was a case of a divorce where an ex-husband was spying on a wife after work or after hours. Basically, every evening at 7 o'clock, there's drone hovering outside the house. Just to check who else is here. Is that a problem of CAA? Is that a problem of the police? Is it a problem of a local municipal? How do we regulate it? Until you are affected, it's not your problem. The Chia Convention was written in 1944. Are we saying drones only existed post 2015, 2013? 
If this convention was written in 1944, why was such concern? And let's look at the concern. It puts the responsibility on the state to ensure that whatever you are allowed to operate in your country, you can assure that those that are coming to your country that it's safe to do so. So we can write our own law, but we are not an isolated state. We are part of the global community. Those foreign airlines fly here. They don't only fly or carry us. The responsibility of the state towards those aircraft is far reaching than what we may think of. Let's let our local national airline collapse. They will still come here. We speak about ARPAs. Let's look at this article. Especially on the next slide where we're going to discuss the toy, aircraft, and the private use. Are they all... Are we not worried about this? The state may prohibit. However, is everything that flies there just a basic ARPAs or is carrying debt? And when it carries debt, what's the intended application? Especially in the hands of a civilian, non-registered private use. Even the kids one today, or what we're going to deem to be toys, they are carrying debt. Now the role of CAA, I'm going to ask you to ignore maybe that column and that column. Let's look at it. Does CAA must do? They need to enable and oversee the development of the civil aviation industry. I said to you earlier on, we don't fly them, we don't design them. This is the demand and the needs of the industry. The regulator's role is to make sure it happens. There are other laws in the state. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this act. And the reason I brought it up, they've got a regulation associated with that act. Check in their view what they deem a drone to be, or ARPAs. A controlled item, who controls it? When civil aviation was established in 1998, there were no drones, there were no ARPAs. If they were there, I think legend said the 1994 election were monitored by the drones, but definitely they were not civilians. If it's a control item, who controls it? In simple terms, this act belongs to the military. The day we lose control, they will take over. Because then the state is at risk. We all want it to grow. But there's going to be a certain level of responsibility that we're going to exercise. Currently, local manufacturers, they will have been visited by this committee. Because at this stage, their main interest is at manufacturing and development. Because what they are seeking is what is the intended operation. We had 101 on around that date, promulgated, then came to effect. I wish to pause and ask a question. What, in your view, has been the success of 101? Thank you. And equally, it came with the challenges. The implementation of it alone brought some more challenges than actually when we didn't have it. There are inherent challenges of which one of the concerns are this definition. If it's a toy, where do you operate it? I think we spoke about model aircraft earlier when Filippo spoke to say, in South Africa for that matter, we go to designated site. You look at the restriction that comes to the private operation. I'll say in Jobek it's almost impossible to operate this aircraft. About a week ago, I had a report from ATNS, airspace infringement, more than 110. Part of me wanted to defend what I was seeing, saying I think every time they meant aircraft pilot, when they, every side of a drone they think is infringement. It's because of that. We, we, we want to regulate that, but how much you want to regulate? 
and it's a CAA alone capable of regulating that. How quick we move from that to that? I'm sure a toy is meant to play with. But what is a private operation intended for? And why would a toy have a camera for that matter? A very complex and sophisticated camera that can spy on the neighbor's pool. Not the one in Kantla. <laughs> we made this provision of part 101 non-applicable to private operation. So in simple terms, we say, don't register it. Don't need a pilot license. You don't need the ROC. You don't need to do maintenance. They don't have a dedicated airspace. We limited the operation, but in true sense, who are these people? If it falls in your backyard, who does it belong to? Was that person adequately competent, or a little not competent, knowledgeable what ought to have been happening? Or where should it be? So what was meant to be a good guide brought also some challenges. I'm going to challenge some people with Dennis here. I think in our last discussion, this allegation, that not allegation, assumption is about 65,000 drones in the country. We only certified 25 ROC operators. Where, and of the 25, the registered drones are about 800. So what happened to the 64,000? Are they toys? Private operation? Even if you see one operating, really, the concern is who does it belong to? Because it comes your side and it disappears. Shouldn't we have mandated at least these two? It did not necessarily have to be a license, but a certain level of competence and knowledge. The ROC, they see us being hard on them. You know why we're hard on them? Because we've got a hold on them. We know them. These guys we don't know, especially the private operation. And these drones will keep coming. <coughs> At 65,000 at the end of the year, we'll be speaking a far scary number than that. And if we still leave them to be private operation with this non-applicability, I don't think we'll even catch up what the number is out there. The success factors, exactly what you said. We had to have 101 to be able to say, if we were to move ahead, we'd have the history to uh, data to work from. I spoke to one of our operators, I think they've just done 65,000 hours of operation. They've had the fortune of being, doing some uh, BV loss operation. I think some of the operators here today will say that's the one difficult ap uh, ap uh, approval to obtain from CAA. It's not a reluctance, but a very safety cautious approach to say, how much was learned in the absence of having 101 that enabled this lesson to have been learned? Remember, I said the military, they've called this reconnaissance and they've got their own term, which implies something else. And if each drone has a camera on board or photographic apparatus on board, what is it used for? They are good intention. Please, don't get me wrong. But as well, there are those intentions that serve other interest groups. But if you don't manage this, other state law enforcement agencies will raise a concern and they'll want action done. But if the CAA come up as not being capable of managing or regulating this, they, the best thing is to stop this operation. Let's stop this thing, let's cease this from operating until such a time we are comfortable to give everybody comfort to say we know what we're doing this thing. But like again, CAA will never be able to do this alone. One of the things to consider, mandatory registration, at least who does it belong to? The registration marks. Currently, most of your drones that are registered with us will be ZT. We checked the numbers in the office the other day. We are only left with about 23,000 registration letters. So, Sean, the day you bring number 25,000, no more registration letters, that's it, done. So the intent is, shouldn't we have went alphanumerical? Akai gave us three letters, ZS, ZT, ZU. Just behind that to put actual numeracy. I don't know, maybe we're register a million. But that it is will allow us to do that. 
did we reach every affected party? And who are affected parties? Remember, we've got a definition of a toy aircraft. That means a person playing the toy is affected party. What did we do? Any outreach project, we're hoping the user will catch up. Now, the user is teaching us, when you don't come to me, what I do in your airspace. Then you call them airspace infringement. With that data, we are able to develop a roadmap to say what do we need to get hold of, what controls we need. One of the lessons learned was we've certified the operator, and I'll say versus registration. Let's certify an airline, conventional manned aviation airline. You know their base of operation, you know they depart from this point to that point. Even non schedule you more or less know what's the main base of operation. With the ARPAS operators, what's their base of operation? Actually, you get a base of existence, but when you operate, you don't know where they are, because it depends where they're being called for for a day. So if CA was to do a continuous oversight, what you call surveillance, where do you find these people? So you are hoping to only find them at their office. Most of the time when you get to the office, their box is packed. How practical is our oversight? If this is a concept operation, aren't we too heavy-handed on the certification side? Because really, it's how you do it, not where you fly from to where. The personal license requirement. I think there's a level of knowledge and skill required to operate this. Let's go to the toy. At least you need to know if it's a toy, what you need to be doing with the toy. And where can you play your toy? And that toy does not become Filippo's mom in law's knife, right? Now, the roadmap, what we need to do. We need to go back to the industry and say, let's solve this before this becomes a problem. It's not even before. We already know it's a problem. But there are entities, individuals, organizations that are affected, especially from the department side or from the, 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 the government side. We need to break that down and say, let's split perception and facts. Are we panicking, or is this reality? People spoke about the classification categorization earlier on. We have to look at it. Are all, should the current 101 apply to everything? Sub 25, above 25 kg. But in the absence of having nothing at a time, we had to come up with something, but that's something taught us a lesson. Make compliance easy, please. That, this does not make no compliance. Main compliance is that how do you enable the applicant to comply? The, most of the applicants in this sector are not coming from the main aviation. They are mainly entrepreneurial. They saw a business opportunity. What have we done for them to comply with this? When a person invests money, they expect something to happen within a reasonable time. And especially considering the uh, certification of an operator. You need to have resources and all this thing before you start operating. So are we saying you're going to pay salaries while you're waiting for certification? If this is new to you, how much of this data is known to you? And if it's not known to you, how do you comply with it? The technical guidance material and acceptable means of compliance. We need to have more of this to prove, I mean, to guide you to say what will be acceptable to us when we are to apply. We cannot leave you alone. I was involved in one certification where the safety manual was bigger than some of the airlines manual. Because we actually forced this individual to go to consultant and have the manual compiled for them. That's how desperate they got. Why shouldn't that guidance not have came from CAA? The oversight. Can we really believe we can conduct oversight in the same way we conduct oversight in the main aviation. I asked earlier on, where are their bases of operation? Don't we need te technology to assist us? Are we gonna put or mandate the installation of the transponder? But guess what? The main aviation guys, they switch off the transponders. The CA as well, 
we need to consider the numbers that we have that are looking after this sector. We did well for research and development initially. But then when we moved to operation, I think we lapsed a bit. And if you don't build that capacity, this problem is not gonna, it's not gonna disappear. The application will come, we're gonna face lawsuits, or well, if we, some of them will lose, or we're gonna have to issue approval at no certification process. Like I asked earlier on, do you want to certify or you want to register these guys based exactly on what they are doing? We spoke about awareness. Filippo spoke earlier on about the manufacturers or the distributors' responsibility. Are we, doing, are we even doing oversight on them? We haven't done that. Yet we expect them to help us to manage this problem. The problem is like cancer. You don't get rid of it, it gets rid of you. We should not regret having had part 101. You have seen on Filippo how this have turned at Akeo. They start to recognize this as now as aircraft. It took the Akai a while, but in true sense, this is another evolution of aviation. And it's here, and it's growing. We can decide to close our eyes and say, it doesn't affect me. You can imagine the impact the foreign operators will do with it coming here, because they will come, remember, the ARPAS will be the international operation. The UAS, we can play among ourselves here, but they will come here. Now, for the forum, these are the people we really want to engage on. And why we group them, so that it's a manageable approach. You can imagine having 5,000 people try to come to common agreement. It will then take us longer to agree, more than actually developing what we need. You start expecting invites from this date. I think it's about 15 days from now. The invite will come with the proposed terms of reference. What are we seeking to work on? And we really need to break it down so that we are able to, the awareness expert into awareness, the commercial guys into commercial operation. We need to break this to what can work for us. This belongs to us, not to the CAA, not to another person outside South Africa, but to South Africa. Now, I said one of the functions of CAA is that, ladies and gentlemen, even if we don't want to, we are mandated by the act to enable that. We've got that responsibility. We can only move to the next level, but our success depends on us, and so is our failure. We can all agree to plan to fail or plan to succeed. And it's not for such individual, it's for all of us. When we go on, the generation after us will ask, what did they do when they were here? And your name cannot be, they did nothing. Because failure is not nothing, it's actually failure. Thank you.